Hey there! Welcome to the ninth episode of the Filters tutorial. In the past episodes we have learned what filters are and their basic functionality, and we also have seen how we can analyze a filter schematic and what a transfer function is. Now that we have all these basics, it is time to go a little deeper and start looking at specific filter topologies. In other words, there are out there some standard schematics of filters used for various applications that have special and useful characteristics for specific situations. Today, we start with what is called the Salen Key filter topology. The name comes from the two MIT researchers that invented and studied these filters. The configuration is also known as Voltage Control Voltage Source, or VCVS, and is largely used because it has a very low dependency on the bandwidth performance of the op-amp used in it. And that because the op-amp in this filter only works as a voltage follower, from which comes the alternative name. Let's begin! Here is the schematic of the most generic Salen Key filter. Its functionality is based on these four impedances present in the circuit. The signal comes from the left and enters impedance Z1, which along with impedance Z3 constitute the first layer of the filter. Z2 and Z4 do an extra layer of filtering, providing in total a second order filter. In addition, Z3 provides a positive feedback from the output toward the input that provides an amplification to the signal making it an active filter. The op-amp in the circuit is there only to help providing such positive feedback. Its operational bandwidth and gain have an effect practically negligible on the total filter functionality and in fact we even set the gain to 1 using a negative feedback from the output to the inverting input. Sometimes you may see a couple of resistors in this feedback that increase the gain of a certain amount. This kind of configuration, however, although extensively used by Salen and Key, it is not often used because, if not properly designed, produces instabilities in the filter, which could easily start oscillating. Therefore, I will not indulge in the description of the more complete schematic and I will concentrate instead on this one, which is widely used in several applications. Given the four impedances, we can analyze this circuit in a generalized way to find its transfer function, which we will see it is of the second order. Once this analysis is completed, we can specify the nature of the impedances and see how the general transfer function changes and how the filter operates in the particular cases. We will see that depending on the impedances used in the circuit, we can make this circuit work mainly as a low-pass filter or a high-pass filter. The filter can also work as a band-pass filter with the appropriate choices of impedances, but for that kind of filter it is usually preferred to make slight variations to the schematic to have it work even better. But this is another story to tell, maybe in a later episode. To analyze this circuit it is easy to proceed using the Kirchhoff current law or KCL which tells us that the sum of all the currents entering the node equals the sum of all the currents leaving the node. Another way to express this law is that the sum of all the currents entering and leaving a node and taken with their sign is always zero, which describes the fact that there can be no accumulation of charges in a node. So many enter and so many have to exit. Basically, conservation of charges. Let's then take the node where impedances Z1, Z2 and Z3 converge and let's call the voltage at that node Vx. Also, since the op-amp is in a voltage follower configuration, we can also state that the voltage of the non-inverting input is the same as the output voltage, and that's because the voltage between non-inverting and inverting inputs of the op-amp must be zero. We can then express the currents across Z1, Z2 and Z3 in terms of these voltages and the impedances themselves, and write down the KCL for the node on the left. Then, we can write a second equation for the node on the right, where Z2 and Z4 connect together. 
Remember that there is no current entering or leaving your pump inverting input, and so we can write another KCL for this second node, like this. Now we can manipulate the second equation to extract Vx. And we can also rewrite the first equation this other way. Now we can put together the two equations, replacing the Vx in the second equation with the value found from the first equation. Some more manipulations to make the equation easier to understand, and we obtain the transfer function of the filter in the schematic. Like we said, you can see that at the denominator we have a sum of products of two impedances, and therefore the denominator has two poles, making this filter a second-order filter, which we know that is going to have a slope of 40 dBs per decade when attenuating the input signal. Let's see now how we can specialize this generic filter to obtain the low-pass filter. The Sun & Key low-pass filter is obtained by replacing the four impedances with appropriate resistors and capacitors. In particular, we will replace Z1 with a resistor R1, Z2 with a resistor R2, Z3 with a capacitor C1, and Z4 with a capacitor C2, obtaining this new circuit. The impedances values accordingly will be Z1 equals R1, Z2 equals R2, Z3 equals 1 over SC1, and Z4 equals 1 over SC2. If we now replace these values in the general transfer function, we obtain this, which we can readjust this way, and then this way. Let me now define omega zero as 1 over square root of R1, R2, C1, and C2, and F0 as omega over 2 pi, which we call the natural frequency. Now we can write the transfer function this other way. And we can now define also a new entity which we call attenuation, as part of the coefficient of the S in the denominator of the transfer function. We will see later the meaning of these two entities, right now we just need to rewrite one more time the transfer function based on these values. And now we define yet another parameter which we call Q factor as omega zero over two alpha. and also its opposite, the damping ratio, as alpha over omega zero, or 1 over 2q. Finally, we can calculate the value of the two poles of the transfer function, which can be easily expressed using these new parameters. Let's now take a closer look at the q factor to understand its meaning and effect on filters. Let's represent graphically the transfer function of the filter. For very low frequencies, the omega elements in the equation become negligible with respect to the other parameters. And so the module of the transfer function approaches 1 and stays that way until the effect of the frequency is no more negligible. Conversely, for very high frequencies, the module of the transfer function goes down at a rate of 40 dB per decade, since this is a second order filter. But what happens in between? For filters we examined in the past, we transition from the beginning of the diagram to the end with a smooth curve, which starts going heavily down when we reach the pole of the function. With more complicated filters like the sound and key that we are examining, things become more complicated. In particular, when we draw the central part of the curve, we notice that it is heavily affected by the value of the Q factor. For Q factors smaller than 1, the curve is smooth, but it stays lower than we have seen in previous kind of filters. However, when Q approaches the value of 1, still being smaller than 1, we see that the curve tends to move higher and higher. When Q reaches the value of 1, then the curve is exactly what we would expect from the analysis of previous filters. But now, 
If we increase q past the value of 1, something different starts to happen. The shape of the curve becomes like a non-symmetrical bell, and the more the q is high, the more pointy and high becomes the shape of such bell. But why would we want to do something like that? Simple. To have a stronger change of slope in proximity of the pole. Basically, to make the filter start acting faster when we reach the natural frequency. Without the effect of the Q factor, once we reach the pole of the function, we need to wait for the module to decrease of 3 dB before we start feeding the effect of the filter. But with a strong effect of the Q factor, the module reaches those 3 dB of attenuation much faster and the behavior of the filter in that region becomes closer and closer to the ideal case, almost vertical. It is for this reason that when designing a second-order filter, we usually provide two design parameters, the natural frequency and the Q, rather than only the natural frequency of cutoff frequency. Designing the filter then becomes a compromise between how fast the attenuation needs to increase in the proximity of the pole and how big is the peak of the bell that we can tolerate for the particular application. Let's explain this design issue with an example. Note that at this point we have two design parameters, f0 and q, but we have four variables that need to be fixed, r1, r2, c1 and c2. So we end up having a two degree of freedom in the calculations because we can only write two equations, the one for the f0 and the one for the q, but we need to figure out four unknowns, r1, r2, c1 and c2. Now, there are several ways to approach this problem, each named after the scientists that propose the solution. And here is why names like Bessel, Chebchev, Butterworth and others come from, all referring to a procedure that confer a very specific shape to the region around the poles of the transfer function. All these resolution methods require some high-level math to be approached. For now, I will use a simpler method that is often used when the filter doesn't need to have any special need. This method is based on an assumption made on the four unknowns. And basically, we will assume that the values of the two resistors have a predefined ratio, and also the two capacitors will have a specific ratio of values. Moreover, we can define the Q factor as a function only of those ratios, that way, we can proceed with the design working independently on the cutoff frequency and on the Q factor, avoiding that the choices for the first parameter will affect the second. It is a great simplification if you think about it. So let's call M the ratio between the two resistances and N the ratio between the two capacitances. We can then write that R1 equals MR and R2 equals R over M and then that C1 equals NC, and C2 equals C over N. Thanks to M and N, we now need to work only with one resistor R and one capacitor C. Let's see how all our equations can be written in these new terms. This is for omega 0, and therefore for the cutoff frequency, and this is for the Q factor. Note that the cutoff frequency depends only on R and C, while the Q factor depends only on M and N, total independence between the two. At this point, we can work on the first design parameter, and once done, we can work on the other, separately, independently. To make a working example, let's assume that our design requires a cutoff frequency of 18 kHz and a Q factor of 0.8, which assures a smooth transition from the two sides of the transfer function module. And now, let's consider first the effect of the Q factor. We can write that mn over m square plus 1 equals 0.8. And now we can rearrange the equation to find n as a function of m. And now let's make an assumption, totally arbitrary, that the value of m is 1, so that the two resistors are identical. We can make any assumption in those terms. I decided to set m equals 1 to make it easier to find the right resistors, but I could have used any other value, actually. But now, being m equals 1 from the equation, we find that n equals 
Let's now use the other design parameter, f0, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi rc. And let's select a resistor R of 10 kilo ohms. A few calculations, and the value for C is 884 picofarads. Now we can calculate the actual values of R1, R2, C1, and C2. So this is for R1, this is for R2, this is for C1, and this is for C2. So now we can draw the actual schematic for our filter after adjusting the capacitors for the closest values that I have available. Here's the low-pass uh, silent key filter that I built based on the calculations that we had done to have a frequency of 18 kHz, a cutoff frequency of 18 kHz, and a Q of 0 0.8. I have connected my function generator on the input of the filter and the oscilloscope on the output. Let's take a look at the two components. Here is the function generator and uh, you can see right now we have a sine wave of 5 kHz and 5 volts peak to peak and uh, on the oscilloscope we can see the effect of the filter at this frequency and uh, now if I go up and down through the frequency you see right now it's 5 kHz. Let's see what the effect is. And basically you see here it doesn't change anything, going down, going up instead, the shape was decreasing because of the effect of the filter. Here for example we are at 36, 37 kilohertz. Actually. So, uh, let's go back to a lower frequency. This is a low pass filter. So let's start from here, 3 kilohertz for example. I already set my cursor so that we have a change in amplitude of 0 0.07 volts. Uh, well, it's actually 0 0.72 because I don't have enough definition over here to do exactly that. But it should be enough for our uh, purposes. So I'm going to now increase the frequency until the, the shape of the wave goes to the lower cursor and that will be the cutoff frequency of uh, this filter. Okay, so let's adjust uh, the cursor so that it touches exactly the top over there. Okay, and now let's increase the frequency. Okay, it went down too much. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Remember that we have a gap of 720 instead of 707, so I left a little bit of leverage here to address that point. And the frequency is uh, 19 kHz, which is uh, good enough, considering that I had to change a little bit the capacitor's values, because I didn't have the exact values that I required for 18 kHz. So yes, the filter works just fine, exactly as we predicted, exactly as we designed it for and if we wanted to have an exact 18 kilohertz, we would have uh, chosen for C1 and C2 more precise capacitors with respect to what I put in, uh, in the circuit. All well then. Now, let's pause right here our discussion on the silent key filters. I understand that this is not an easy to follow subject, so it's better if we stop here to give you time to let all these notions sink before we put more of them out there. In the next video of this series, we will introduce the sound and key high-pass filters, going through both the analysis and the design of these filters, and then we will make some examples on how to make band-pass filters, combining all the notions gathered up to that point. After that, I'm sure you'll have enough information to understand the sound and key filters, enough to be able to design your own filter for your own necessities. And now, what's left to do for you is to subscribe to the channel, click on the bell to activate the notifications, and so you won't miss any future episode. That, of course, if you haven't done so already. See you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!